I want to ask you to take your Bible and turn with me to the Gospel of John chapter 4. The Gospel of John chapter 4 and be locating, if you would please, verse 39. That's on page 74 of the New Testament in those pew Bibles. If you've grabbed a Bible out of the book rack, turn to page 74 and you'll be with us in John chapter 4. I heard about a woman who was getting married and on her wedding day she she was nervous she was afraid that she would forget where she was supposed to go you know weddings can be these highly orchestrated events and as she stood out in the lobby on her daddy's arm she said daddy I'm just afraid that I won't remember where am I supposed to stand here there all the different places in the ceremony he said honey it's real easy all you got to remember is three things walk down the aisle walk to the altar walk up to him down the aisle to the altar up To him, down the aisle, to the altar, up to him. And so she said, I think I can remember that. Uh, uh, Down the aisle, to the altar, up to him. And she said, I'll alter him. I'll alter him. I'll alter him. And many women and perhaps some men have foolishly stood and said their nuptials with with the fictitious notion that we would be able to alter one another. But the reality is there's not a man in the building that can change any woman, not a woman in the building that can ultimately change any man, except there is one man who can change everyone. That is the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're seeing him on display in John's Gospel as we're moving through this series of messages called I Believe. And we've made our way up to the concluding verses of John chapter 4. I confessed to you last week that I was a little sketchy on how to preach these verses. And so we just postponed its delivery for an additional week. But then I remembered there's a key hanging by the back door of John's gospel. Have you learned that fact by now as we've been moving through the gospel of John? There are 21 chapters in the gospel of John. And right near the back door of the gospel... John hangs a key so that anybody who wants to unlock the treasures of this book will know how to interpret it. It is there that John says, These things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and believing you may have life in his name. And so as we move through these verses, here's what they tell us. That Jesus Christ is the virgin-born, sinlessly living, sacrificially dying, victoriously risen Son of the Most High God. And if we will place our faith in that great gospel truth, our sins can be forgiven, our forever can be changed. We can have eternal life in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now today from these verses, I just want to show you a simple little message. Three ways to the one way. Three ways to the one way. Would you stand with your Bible open to honor the reading of God's precious and perfect word, John chapter 4. We begin reading in verse 39. And from that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things that I have done. And so when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. After the two days, he went forth from there into Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they themselves also went to the feast. Therefore he came again to Cana of Galilee where he had made the water wine. And there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he had heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son. For he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. The royal official said to him, Sir... Come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, Go, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. And as he was now going down, his slaves met him saying that his son was living. So he inquired of them the hour that he began to get better. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. The father knew that it was at that hour in which Jesus had said to him, Your son lives. 
And he himself believed in his whole household. This is again a second sign that Jesus performed when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word as we take our seats this morning. Three ways to the one way. You know, of course, the Bible teaches and this church believes and this pastor proclaims that salvation comes through Jesus Christ and through Christ alone. We've not made up the doctrine of what we call the exclusivity of Christ. We get it right from the pages of the Word of God. Jesus said of himself in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Simon Peter affirmed this truth in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, when he said, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Paul speaks of this truth in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, where he said that there is only one God and only one mediator between God and man, uh, the man Christ Jesus. But yet we find that there are many ways that God draws people to the one way, Jesus Christ the Lord. For example, some people come to Christ through the preaching of a gospel sermon. It's my prayer this morning that if you're here without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, God would use me to declare his saving gospel. And at the conclusion of this message, you will repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people come through the preaching of a gospel sermon. Others come when they hear a a song that contains the gospel, like the beautiful song that we heard just a few moments ago, how we can be forever changed through a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I pray that that happens in the lives of many people. Some of you perhaps got saved when someone left you a gospel tract. Or maybe someone shared their salvation testimony. God uses all types of ways to share the one truth about the one way and the one life that can be found in the one and only Son of God, Jesus Christ the Lord. And we find here in these verses a picture of three of those ways. The old songwriter perhaps said it best when he said, Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. All of these ways are leading to Jesus Christ, who is the one and only way of salvation. I want you to notice these three ways to the one way. Notice with me, first of all, one way to the cross is through the witness of a saint. By the end of three days, Jesus led this woman to himself. The people came out and implored him to stay. He stayed an additional two days. You add that together and you have a three-day stay in the city of Sychar, the village of the Samaritans. And by the end of these three days, this sin-sick woman who had come to faith in Christ was personally responsible for bringing what one verse calls many and another verse calls many more She's personally responsible for bringing them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice that she did not do that by writing a doctrinal discourse or sharing a theological treatise. She did it by simply sharing the transforming experience she had personally had with Jesus Christ. You remember when we saw her salvation earlier in this chapter. She ran back into the village of Sychar and she simply said, Come and meet a man who told me everything I've ever done and Rhetorically, what she, what she indicated was this man is the Christ. She said, I've met a man who's changed me. And his name is Jesus Christ. And if you'd like to meet him, you can meet him too. I can tell you where he is. I can take you to him. This lady had turned her life literally into an old-fashioned gospel tract. And she just reveals the truth of the gospel through the witness of a saint. Now, if her life is a gospel track, I propose that little evangelistic pamphlet has three panels or three pages. Notice with me, first of all, there's the indication of her condition before Christ. The Bible says in verse 39, From that city many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. Come meet a man who told me all the things that I've done. Now, do you remember this woman's life story? (laughs) She had quite a reputation, and it wasn't a good one. She had quite a past. It was not a pretty one. Do you remember who she was and how she had lived? I imagine respectable mothers pulled their children in close when this woman walked by. I imagine when 
her children asked your children to come over for a sleepover. You tried to find a polite way to say, now's not a good time. This isn't a good night for you to go spend the evening over at their house. Wives got upset when they saw their husbands talking to this woman. Religious fervor called the legalistic Pharisees and even the religious Samaritans of their day to shun this woman. And so she goes down to the well of Jacob in the noon hour in the heat of the day trying to get away from the scornful, scoffing look that she's shunned by polite society. She's been married five times, presumably divorced, and now living in a sinful relationship with man number six. She was living like she had been living because she was what she was. Don't miss that. She was doing what she had been doing because she was what she had been. Her condition before Christ. Come meet a man who told me all the stuff that I have ever done. The wicked, sinful, ugly stuff from my past. Now before we look down our religious noses at this woman, may I stop here and just say that whether you like it or not, her story is your story. Her story is my story. Oh, your sin may not have been exactly what her sin was, but it was just as repulsive, repugnant, and unacceptable to a holy God. Her story is your story. I know we put on our suit and our dress and we look our best on a Sunday morning at the early bird service, but I'm telling you, her story is your story and her story is my story. Her story has the common thread of every mother's child that has ever been born because all we like sheep have gone astray. Each and every one of us has turned to his own wicked way. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says that sin entered the world by way of death and now death has spread to all men because all have sinned. This woman has a past and if you're saved You've got a past too. And one thing that the world needs to hear from us is an acknowledgement of our condition before Christ. Come meet a man who told me about all the nasty stuff back in the yesterdays of my life. I don't care if you got saved in the first grade at vacation Bible school. I don't care if you got saved as a teenager at youth camp. I don't care if you got saved as a middle-aged person at a Tuesday night revival service. I don't care if you got saved as a senior adult after having wasted many, many years. The fact is, this woman's story is our story. We all had a condition before Christ. Not only does this woman testify about her condition before Christ, but we see her confession of Christ. You see, what the world needs to hear to draw people to Christ is someone who will say, I was a sinner separated from God. I was a sinner by my nature. I was a sinner by my actions. But then I met the Lord Jesus Christ. Come meet a man who told me all the things I've ever done. It's worth noting that this woman is not pointing people to herself. I hope if you share your testimony, you don't try to tell people about the wise decision that you made or how you changed, how you found the Lord. You didn't find the Lord. He wasn't lost. (laughs) I hope that your salvation testimony is not pointing people to yourself. This woman is not pointing to herself or a decision that she's made. She's saying, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. Now, the power of her testimony is not in its depth. The power of her testimony is not in its complexity. The power of her testimony is not that she can dot every theological I and cross every theological T. She simply says, come meet a man who has changed my life. You do understand the power of your testimony is not in you, but it's in him. The power of the gospel is not in our style, but it's in the very subject matter of the gospel itself. That Jesus Christ is in the life-transforming business. Don't let it bother you that you don't feel that you can share a powerful gospel presentation. The gospel has the power all on its own. Adrian Rogers used to frequently say, You may be able to preach the gospel better than me, but you can't preach a better gospel than me. (laughs) And I may be able to declare the gospel better than some of you, but I cannot declare a better gospel than you can. 
Friend, if you've been saved, if you've been born again, you, by definition, know enough to tell someone how they can confess Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. This woman tells about her condition before Christ. All the stuff that I've ever done. This woman makes a confession of Christ. Come meet this man. This woman's witness also includes her conversion by Christ. That's the nature of a testimony. Here's who I was before Jesus. Here's how I met Jesus. Here's how my life has been transformed since Jesus. This woman's life story is evidence of this truth. Listen carefully. One of the greatest gospel witnesses is the simple evidence of a transformed life. One of the greatest ways you and I can witness is simply by being different from the sin-sick world and being different from the person that we were before we met the Lord Jesus. This woman shares about her conversion by Christ. When we last saw her, she left her water pots down by the well and went running into the city. I told you then that her leaving of her water pots was typical or symbolic of a changed life. Everything about this woman had been changed. Now I need to confess to you, I don't know exactly how she evidenced that change because I really don't know everything that we could know about this woman. I I don't know everything about her, so I don't know exactly how she evidenced transformation, but I know that she did. Maybe when she went back into the village, she wasn't carrying herself in that seductive, sultry way anymore. Anybody in the building know what I'm talking about? Maybe as she ran back into the village of Sychar, her, her neckline was a little bit higher, her hemline just a little bit lower. Maybe when she went back into the village, before she went sharing her testimony, she went home and put on another shirt that didn't take her 15 minutes to climb into. You look all spiritual like you don't know what I'm talking about. Maybe when she said something to the men. Maybe it wasn't the the tempting words of, of, uh, of an immoral woman. Maybe her language wasn't littered with the, 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 the filthy, the vulgar, and the, the coarse terminology of the four-letter sexy little words. Maybe, maybe this woman didn't use inappropriate gestures and looks when she went back to what the Bible calls the men of the city. And says, come meet a man who told me all the things I've ever done. Maybe that's what changed about this woman. But as I began to study this passage, I have to realize we don't really know that for a fact about that woman. Maybe this woman wasn't like that at all. Maybe she was like the scores of men and women who've sat in my office and nailed at places of repentant prayer with your pastor. Maybe she wasn't a boisterous, immoral woman. Maybe she was a woman whose shoulders were slumped forward and her chin was on her chest because she didn't want to look people in the eye. Maybe the transformation that she evidenced was on her countenance. Maybe that sad, ashen face of a life that has been marred by sin and beaten down by her own wickedness. Maybe all of a sudden, that face of fear was replaced with the grin of grace. Maybe somebody said before she said a word, something is different about that woman. Maybe the people in the village of Sychar saw her eyes for the first time in years because she's suddenly able to look them in the face. Maybe the villagers noticed the fact that she was actually talking to people and not trying to take the back alleys and the side streets and the byways and avoid polite society. Maybe maybe she ran into the village for the first time in a long time with her shoulders back and her head held high, not proud of that old sinful life that she used to live, but maybe realizing that that's who she was, but it's not who she was 
now. Maybe, just maybe, for the first time she had taken a drink of the living water of Jesus Christ and she realized that she had been transferred from death unto life and from darkness to light and she'd been justified in the sight of a holy God. Maybe this woman's face and her actions were different because she simply had the joy of Jesus shining upon her face. Maybe the sin that had muted her voice was finally gone and just maybe this woman was singing I was shackled by a heavy burden I was neath a load of guilt and shame but down by Jacob's well the hand of Jesus touched me. I don't have to be ashamed anymore because I'm never going to be the same again. Now friend, that is what the world needs to see. That's what the world needs to experience. That's what the world needs to hear in the witness of a saint. This dear lady had a story like every child of God has. Here's who I was before I met Jesus. Here's how I met Jesus. Here's the change in my life. Oh, what a wonderful change in my life. Life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. God is still in the business of drawing people to Christ through the witness of the saint. Notice now in verses 40 to 42, y'all aren't listening fast enough. Not only the witness of the saint, but the words of the Savior. These villagers make it very clear. We believed on him at first because of what you said, dear lady. Your witness, your testimony. But now we believe in him because of his word. Oh, what a preacher Jesus was. On one occasion, the people asked, where did he go to school? Where did he learn to preach like that? Never a man spake like this man. When when Jesus walked with the disciples on the Emmaus Road, they would later testify that when he was preaching, their hearts were burning inside of them. I think these encounters might just have been a little glimpse, a little, a little taste, a little sliver, if you please, about a two-day Bible study that Jesus had in the little Samaritan village of Sychar. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly what he told them, but understanding all of the Bible, we can make some good spiritual imagination about what Jesus might have said. Now, the words of the Savior preached the gospel. First of all, by the grace of his presence, the Bible says in verse 40, the Samaritans came to Jesus and asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. The grace of his presence. Remember how the Jews hated him? How the Jews hated the Samaritans, I should say? And this woman was surprised that Jesus had even had an encounter with her, that he would speak to her. Do you remember what she said? How is it you're speaking to me, a Samaritan woman? Back in the 8th century B.C., you remember the Assyrian Empire had come in and conquered this part of God's promised land. Taking the people off into captivity. But some of these Samaritans, the, the leftovers, the rejects of society, stayed in that region. And when the Assyrians repopulated the area with pagan Gentiles, the Samaritans just mingled right in with them. They began to intermingle. They began to intermarry. And because of this... Most Jews would not even put foot upon the Samaritan soil. And yet the one that is without sin, without blame, without spot, blemish, or wrinkle. Not only did he go there for a brief visit, but they said, Jesus, would you stay a while? And he stayed for two additional days. What I'm trying to say to you as simply as I know how is just the fact that Jesus would go and the simple fact that Jesus would stay is an evidence of grace. Lean in real close, listen to your preacher this morning. The fact that Jesus would have anything to do with you, you, the fact that my Lord would have anything to do with me, See, I know me. It surprises me more than it may surprise you because I know me like you don't know me. It, The fact that Jesus would have anything to do with me. That's grace right by itself. If he didn't do anything but 
but come into my presence and speak a word to me. I'd be able to sing for 10,000 of thousands of years. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that even spoke to a wretch like me. The Samaritans did not deserve the presence of Jesus. But as Squire Parsons famously said in a song, when I could not come to where he was, he came to me. And he came to these Samaritans. Maybe it's just the simple fact that one they would realize was the Messiah would stand and sit and speak in their presence. Maybe the grace of that is what began to draw them. The grace of his presence. Notice in verse 41, the gospel in his preaching. Verse 41, many more believe because of his word. What was it that Jesus was preaching? Well, earlier in his ministry... He sat in the temple and read from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and said, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. I believe when they say they believe because of Jesus' words, he was preaching the gospel. Now you have to know this about the Samaritans. They only believed the first five books of the Old Testament. The the Pentateuch, the law of, of Moses. Uh, In their Bible, they had whittled it all away. And they only embraced Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I think Jesus might very well have done for them what he's done for me. And that is just met them where they were, took them where they needed to go. What if Jesus, sitting in that Samaritan Bible study, said, Okay, you only believe the first five books of what we call the Old Testament? We can go there. You see, back in the Garden of Eden, do you remember when Adam and Eve sinned and tried to cover up their nakedness with their own human effort, fig leaves, but God the Father, can you hear Jesus teaching them? Do you remember when God the Father had to kill an animal and blood had to be shed to cover the nakedness of their sin? Jesus might have said, that was me. (laughs) Do you remember when sin had so consumed the world that God prophesied that judgment was going to be poured out and he he hid away Noah and seven members of his family inside an ark of gopher wood and everybody that was inside that ark was saved from the rainwaters of of, of judgment? Jesus might have said, that was me. (laughs) He might have said, do you remember when Father Abraham went up that mountain range right over there in in the distance and he carried his one and only son Isaac up to the top of Mount Moriah and, and raised the knife and was about to plunge it into Isaac's heart and the angel of God came and grabbed his hand and his heart and lifted up his eyes to a ram a male member of the sheepfold that, that had his horns called in a, in a thicket of thorns and, and God said, I'm going uh, to provide myself a lamb. Jesus might have said, that was me. He might have said, do you remember when Jacob, we're down here by Jacob's well, do you remember when Jacob was running from Esau, stopped at a certain place, laid down, went to sleep, had a dream about a ladder that was descending from heaven down to earth and angels were ascending and descending on that ladder. Jesus said, that ladder was me. I am the extension of God's mercy from heaven come down to earth. And if anybody wants to get from earth to heaven, you've got to go by way of me. Oh, you believe the book of Exodus? I'm the deliverer that Moses pictured. I'll bring you out of the bondage of sin. I am the ultimate Passover lamb. And if you'll apply the blood of my coming cross to the doorposts of your life, then the angel of death will pass over. When you come to Leviticus, I'm the high priest and the blood of the sacrifice all at the same time. When you come over to the book of Numbers, you're going to find that I am the one that is the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. When you get to Deuteronomy... I've got good news because not only am I the one that provided the law and set the standard, but I'm the one, if you know the book of Deuteronomy, that established the cities of refuge. That once you realize you've broken the laws of God, you can run to that city of refuge and there you can be free from the coming wrath and the coming judgment. Jesus says, I am all those things. And many believed on him because of his word. 
the grace of his presence, the fact that he would simply be with them, the gospel in his preaching. But notice in verse 42 the glory of his person. The Bible says in verse 42, we, we ourselves, <laughs> uh, we believe and we have heard for ourselves and we know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. That, that's an interesting title for Jesus. It only appears two times in the Bible, Savior of the world. Both are in the writings of John, once here in this text and once in 1 John chapter 4, verse 14, where John said, We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. I'll never forget the woman that had visited our church, and I called her on the phone the next morning to thank her for her visit. She expressed very kind things about the church, but then she asked me, I asked her if she had ever been saved. She said, Where do you Baptists come up with this word saved? I said, From the Bible. Remember Jesus said in Luke 19.10, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Peter said that the name of Jesus is the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 15, Here's a trustworthy statement that deserves full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And here these Samaritans, they they sense the presence of Jesus, they listen to the preaching of Jesus, and they deem him to be the Savior of the world. Now, I've called this the glory of his person for this reason. John is constantly reminding us that salvation is not found merely by believing something, but by receiving someone. Salvation is not found by mentally assenting to a set of facts, doctrines, or creeds. Salvation is found by receiving Him, Jesus Christ. This man is the Savior of the world. How does God bring people to His Son, Jesus Christ? Well, He does it through the witness of this saint. He does it through the words of the Savior, the very words of Christ. But then, finally, I want you to notice, He does it through the working of the sign. Here we come to verses 43 to 54, and we we find that Jesus performs... A very interesting miracle. By the way, when you see Jesus performing miracles, he doesn't do it just to do it. Listen carefully. The miracles that Jesus performs are miracles with a message. Signs with a sermon. He doesn't do it just to do it. He does it to show something. You remember in Mark chapter 2, the men that tore off the roof, lowered their paralyzed friend on a mat down in the presence of Jesus. Do you remember that well-loved story? Jesus said to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. The crowd cried, who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus read their minds and said, listen, so that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sin, I say to you, son, rise, take up your bed, And go home. Jesus is still in the business of performing miraculous signs and wonders for those, listen, that are sincerely seeking Him. He is not bothered to attest to His words with a performance of signs and wonders. In fact, in Matthew chapter 11, the disciples of John the Baptist. Come and they ask Jesus. John is very obviously in a dark season of doubt. And he sends two of his own disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the Messiah? I'm talking about John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist had a moment of doubt about the person of Jesus. Sent two of his disciples. Are you the Messiah or should we look for another? And Jesus said, Go back and tell John what you have seen and what you have heard. Go back and tell John that the blind are receiving their sight. Tell John that the lepers are being cleansed and the lame are walking. Tell him that the deaf are starting to hear and the dead are being raised. Go back and tell John the Baptist that I am who I say I am and I will prove it by what I can do. So Jesus in this passage draws people unto himself through the working of a sign. Let me show you three things very quickly about this truth. First of all, I want you to notice a sober warning. 
Beginning in verse 43, we have actually one of the controversial passages from this text. Notice, notice very carefully, verse 43. After two days he went forth from there into Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Now Jesus was a Galilean. And he makes a statement to the Samaritans, I've got to go into Galilee, but he says, now, I'm not going to be received there because a prophet is not received in his own country. But then look at the very next verse. Verse 45, so when he came into Galilee, the Galileans received him. Having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went to the feast. Do you see the tension in this text? I said, do you see the tension in this text? I said this morning, do you see the tension in this text? So you've got to see the tension so that I can resolve it for you. Jesus says, in essence, I'm going back to my home country of Galilee. But a prophet is not accepted, not received, not honored in his own country. I'm not going to be honored there. I'm not going to be received there. And the very next verse says, and the Galileans gladly received him. The answer to this dilemma is a sober warning. Because Jesus tells them in, in, the, in, the, in the passage that follows. You remember the nobleman comes and falls at his feet perhaps and says, my son is sick, please come to my house and heal him. And Jesus says in this text, you people, the word you is in the plural, you people won't believe unless you see a sign. The Galileans believed upon Christ, listen, at a superficial level. The Bible says they believed on him and received him gladly because they had seen the signs that he had did at the feast in Jerusalem. Back at the end of chapter 2, we read about all the miracles that Jesus was performing in the city of Jerusalem at the time of the Passover. And these Galileans were there. They beat Jesus back to Galilee because he stopped in Samaria for three days. They, They beat him back to the home country. And when he got there, they said, hey, this is the guy that was doing all the miracles. We want him. And yet Jesus, listen, rebukes that kind of reception. He says, if you're only willing to receive me because of what I can do for you in terms of this earthly existence, you've not really received me at all. And by the way, that is a prevailing, constant theme of John's gospel. People who flock to him for the miraculous... People who who follow him because of the wow factor. But they don't really want to follow Christ. By the way, their descendants are still with us today. People who follow Christ because of the wow and the spectacular. But when the wow turns to work, and when the spectacular turns to service, They fall away demonstrating theirs was not a genuine believing faith. Now, if you don't know folks like this, let me explain a fight a little bit better. You know them. (laughs) They'll come and clap and shout and rejoice and might never miss a service. But you ask them to work in the nursery and they're not interested in that. They'll come as long as the choir's hot and the preaching is encouraging, but the moment you ask them to work at Vacation Bible School, that's not what they signed up for. Only following Christ with a consumer mentality. Could I just let you in on a secret? The church of the living God is not Burger King. We're not here to do it your way. And there's so many people. They act as if they're following Christ. But the first time the church doesn't scratch every itch, stroke their ego, meet all their needs and float their boat, they do what you do when you get bad service at a restaurant. They take their credit card somewhere else. And Jesus rebukes that kind of spurious, deceptive, defective faith. There's a sober warning in this text. But I want you to notice something else. That is a spectacular wonder. The Bible tells us in verses 49 through 52 that Jesus looks at the man and simply says, Go, your son lives. We don't know exactly what sickness had fallen upon this young man, but we know that he was at death's door. And we know from this text that 
that the biggest problem was a high fever. We don't know what had caused it, but he had a high fever. He's at the point of death. And this man did what every parent in the building would do. You see, this man had been down at uh, Capernaum. And after Jesus left Cana of Galilee, where he had performed all the miracles, the Bible says he went to Capernaum for a few days. This man was from Capernaum. No doubt he had heard about the miracle-working power of Jesus. He'd heard about that water-to-wine thing that had happened at the wedding reception. And now that his son is at death's door, he hears that the man who could do that is in a nearby town. And he comes from Capernaum over to this city in Galilee. And he begins to beseech the Lord. My son is at the point of death. I need you to come to my house and heal him. And Jesus simply said, go, your son lives. A spectacular wonder. A sober warning. By the way, there may be someone here this morning. You would say, preacher, I, I'd believe if I could see a great miracle like that. Take your right hand and hold up just in front of you. Just look at it. That's a miracle right there. Strength in your body, breath in your lungs. You want to see a miracle? Go outside and watch a tiny little blade of grass pushing up through the dirt of the earth. Stop by the nursery hallway and listen to the cry of a baby. God is performing miraculous signs and wonders around you every single day. And they're pointing to his identity that he is God, we're not. And if we're going to be reconciled to him, we've got to find a way. And so Jesus heals this, little, this man's little boy. A spectacular wonder, a sober warning. And then in verses 53 and 54, there is a saving witness. The performance of this miracle has an evangelistic effect in this man's home. After he gets home and sees his son, his faith is confirmed at a whole other level. The Bible says that he believed on Christ, he and all his family. By the way, I want to say to the dads in the building this morning. I want to say to the fathers in the building this morning. It is an incredible thing to watch. Almost without exception. There are exceptions, but almost without exception. If a daddy will get right with God, he can lead his wife and his children to serve the Lord as well. Here's a man who believes upon Christ and his faith spreads to his entire household. Sir, it may be that one of the things God wants to use to bring your family into a right walk with God and a right relationship with Jesus is you simply doing what God has called you to do. In the 1940s, there was a foul-mouthed, loose-living disc jockey out in Los Angeles named Stuart Hamblin. Standards were totally different in that day, but in that day he'd be their version of Howard Stern. Always pushing the envelope of indecency. Well, in 1949, a young evangelist by the name of Billy Graham came and conducted what became an internationally famous crusade in Los Angeles. And Stuart Hamblin said that he wanted to go to the crusade and and frankly he just said the only reason he wanted to go he wanted to get some new material to mock Billy Graham for his radio program. And that night when he heard the young North Carolina evangelist preach Billy Graham said something that cut him to the quick. He didn't get saved in the service. But about 2 a.m. he testifies that he showed up at Dr. Graham's hotel room drunk as a skunk wanting to be saved. And Dr. Graham Told him he needed to come in, sit down a while, sober up. No point in trying to talk to a drunk about anything. But when the man sobered up in the early hours of that morning, Billy Graham led Stuart Hamblin to faith in Christ. His life was radically changed. So much so that he was eventually fired from his very prominent radio show because he wouldn't tell the jokes he used to tell. He wouldn't read the radio script for some of the companies and products that he used to push. I mean, his life had been changed. But he couldn't get any work. A friend of his who just happened to be John Wayne. I've told you he's out in Hollywood. He's in L.A. And John Wayne asked him, has it been worth it? And he said, John, it's been worth it all. And if you'll believe on Christ, he'll do the same thing for you. You probably wouldn't even know Stuart Hamblin except for the fact that after that encounter, he went home, got out his guitar and began to write a song. It is no secret 
what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. And with arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. Now, friend, I don't know why you've come this morning. You may have come as a child because your parents made you. You may have come as a teenager because you want to see your friends. Maybe as a senior adult, you came because you wanted to get out of the house. You may have even come just because you're looking for another reason to get some new material to mock God. The important thing is not what brought you here. The important thing is, will you come to Christ? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our time in your word. For a reminder that you use many different things, many avenues, many ways and methods to bring people to Christ. And I pray that you will do that in these precious moments of invitation and decision. For our good and the glory of your holy son Jesus in whose name we pray. Amen.